Hello there my RPG lovers and welcome to another video. Well, this turned into a nice little series. Well, no one's watching. A couple of months ago I started doing these videos, so if you missed them, you can check out the playlist. Today we have another 5 forgotten and obscure games that I played recently and we're going to talk about them a little bit. You're a smart guy. Now let's be honest, the majority of games that fall into obscurity are there for a reason. But that doesn't mean there are bad games by default. In fact, you might be able to find an interesting game to play that you missed when it came out. Maybe there are even some hidden gems in there, but you'll be the judge. So let's dive right in, in the new episode of Forgotten and Obscure RPGs and Action Adventures. Right after I tell you about the sponsor of this video. Clash Royale is a real-time multiplayer game by the creators of the legendary Clash of Clans. Become a master of strategy and deck building by choosing unique cards for your battle deck. The game has over 100 cards to collect and upgrade, which gives you a lot of options for customizing your battle deck. These cards feature the Clash of Clan troops, spells and defenses you know and love, as well as the royals. Knock the enemy king and princesses from their towers to defeat your opponents and win trophies, crowns and the glory in arena. Battle your way to the top of the league and global tournaments against the best players in the world. There are seasonal events which allow you to unlock new items like tower skins, emotes and powerful magic items. Join a clan and go to war, collect rewards and compete for the glory. Use the link in the description or scan the QR code on the screen to download the game and start building your battle deck today. Number 5. Hard to be a god. Hard to be a god is an action RPG released in 2007. You're a smart guy. It's a very flawed but kinda interesting game. Some people would even say that it's a real hidden gem, but to be honest, I wouldn't go so far. However, the game has a couple of features that took me by surprise, and the more I played, the more interesting it got. So what's it all about? Well, I'm glad you asked. What are you, a sissy? Hard to be a god has a medieval slash sci-fi setting with a unique story. The story doesn't seem all that interesting at first, especially because it starts off really slow. Your character is a mercenary and you start the game in an Imperial intelligence camp. After you're introduced to some basic gameplay tips, you get a quest to kill a band of thieves who are terrorizing the merchants in the capital city. That's everything you get about the story in the beginning and I thought it's going to be very generic and boring, but I was wrong. It opens up a lot more as you play and if you're willing to pay attention to the dialogue, you could find this story very interesting. Oh yeah? Then I lied. I like to lie, so get used to it. The writing is surprisingly good, even though it has a bunch of typos and some plot holes here and there. And speaking about surprising features, it's fully voice acted. Even the quality of voice acting is not all that bad, it's good enough to take the story seriously. Young man, are you always running headlong into whatever awaits you? Well, maybe that's not the best way to describe it because there is a lot of humor in the game. The dialogue can be very goofy at times. I don't give a damn about that ugly bitch. Besides, she's a redhead. Aren't all these noble chicks just the same as harbor area whores? The only difference is they use more makeup and stink of sweat a little less. Yeah, anyway, let's talk about the gameplay. At first, I thought the gameplay is going to be very similar to Diablo-like action RPGs, probably because of the camera perspective. Well, it's not. It's a lot slower action gameplay, which controls like a third-person action RPG. Hard to be a god has a very simplistic action gameplay with not a lot of depth. First of all, it's not a point and click game, you control the character with WASD and you use your mouse clicks for attacks. There are only a handful of skills you can learn when you level up and you get to increase a couple of your stats. You can only use the skills with a corresponding weapon type and all of your attacks use stamina as a resource. The stamina system is very similar to more modern games. The action itself is not all that great, but it's simple and it's functional. I played around 10 hours until I realized there is a block button in the game. Yeah, that would be very useful before. So it's not exactly a hack and slash game, you won't mow down a bunch of enemies at once. What really took me by surprise is the mounted combat. You can buy horses in this game, which makes traversing the map a lot more enjoyable, but certain horses allow you to use your weapons as well. 
The mounted combat is a lot easier compared to regular combat, it's not really balanced properly, but it's kinda fun. It reminds me of Sacred 2, although that game had a much superior gameplay in general. Hard to be a god does a good job when it comes to customization, and it has a very interesting feature that I would like to see in modern RPGs. You have a couple of armor slots, but some items will change the role of your character, which means that certain NPCs will treat you differently. For example, in the early game, if you equip some thief armor pieces, you can talk with bandits and thieves and do a certain quest. But if you don't have those armor pieces on you, they will attack you on sight. It's a great idea, but it's really underdeveloped because you don't get to use the same feature later in the game. Speaking about armor pieces, you can equip different cloaks, and check this out, this game has cloak physics. I would say this is really impressive for a 2007 game on a budget. When it comes to the game world, you could say that this is an open world game. You'll have a bunch of smaller maps to explore, which are connected with a loading screen. Besides the big city and some bigger locations, the exploration is pretty linear, with only one or two narrow paths. I would say the environment still holds up when it comes to the visuals. It's not the prettiest looking isometric RPG from 2007, but it's good enough. This game works pretty good on Steam, although you will need to tweak a couple of settings to make your experience the best it can be. It's just the resolution and some camera tweaks which will improve the camera angles a bit. I would recommend getting the game purely because of the story, but don't expect too much from the gameplay. You're as dumb as a man can be, your majesty. Number 4. Vikings, Wolves of Midgar. Vikings Wolves of Midgar is a Diablo-like action RPG from 2017. I remember being kinda excited before this game came out because I love isometric action RPGs. And then I saw some very negative reviews from, well, everyone, and I just decided to skip it. In the meantime, I totally forgot that this game even exists, and I'm sure you did as well, which makes it a perfect fit for one of these videos. <laughs> Is that your attempt to make yourself sound useful? Before I started playing it for the first time ever, I thought I'm going to like it a lot more than I actually did. It turns out I was wrong. Very wrong. What? In fact, this is the first game since I started working on the series that almost made me rage quit, but we'll get to that very soon. I played this game on my PS5 because it's free if you have PlayStation Plus subscription. The plan was to try it out on the PC as well, but after I played it on the PS5, I just refused to spend any money on the game. I'm a huge fan of Vikings in general, so naturally the setting of this game was very appealing to me. Even though it was obvious that it's going to be a very generic Norse mythology setting, but that wouldn't be a problem if the gameplay was better. You start the game by making your character, and you get a couple of customization options. It's a pretty basic character creation menu. The most important option is to select one of the Norse gods, which will give you a starting weapon and one ability. After that, I started the game on hard because I didn't want to be a peasant. <laughs> The intro cutscene is very vague, it only mentions the Ragnarok, the event which is supposed to destroy everything. The Harbinger of Ragnarok, the end of all things. You're the main hero, obviously, who is supposed to save everyone, and that's pretty much it. Like I said, nothing unique. Right off the bat, you get into a fight with some goblins, and the first impressions of the combat are not very good. It's far from the worst action combat that I experienced in these types of games, and it kinda gets a bit better when you get a couple of more abilities. However, the fundamentals of this action combat system have a couple of issues. Controlling your character feels okay, but all of your attacks have a very noticeable input lag. That's one of the reasons why the combat feels very stiff. Another big reason for that are attack animations. And again, not the worst I ever experienced, but they are not very good, to put it lightly. On top of those issues, the game has very bad hitboxes, which is actually the biggest issue with the combat. You have a dodge button that you have to use very often in fights, and it feels really clumsy. And I'm pretty sure the game doesn't have any iframes, which makes dodging attacks a lot more difficult. 
This enemy type was the main reason why I quit the game for a couple of days and I forced myself to play it a bit more before I include it in this video. I usually finish the game even when it's really bad, but I just couldn't drag myself to the end in this particular case. This stupid NPC can block almost everything when you're facing them directly, so you have to attack them from the back, which is easier said than done. The peak of my rage was the boss fight, where the game puts two of these enemies before the actual boss fights. Fighting the boss is a lot easier than fighting these two regular enemies, which should tell you a lot about the gameplay. All shall fall before my might. I actually like the idea of using more skill-based moves in Diablo-like RPGs, but it has to be executed a lot better than this. When you have all of those issues on top of each other, you get a very unsatisfying action gameplay. If somehow you can ignore that, you might be able to have a little fun with this game. Fine, I get the hit. In that case, I would recommend going for a full range build and ignoring the melee combat altogether. The leveling up system is a bit weird. You have to sacrifice the blood you collect if you want to increase some of your stats. But you get skill points when you level up, which you can invest in passive and active abilities. The abilities you can get are pretty decent. All of these abilities are locked behind a certain weapon type, which actually limits the gameplay quite a bit. The loot is obviously RNG and you absolutely need to find better weapons because it's a huge difference in fights, especially against bosses. The maps are quite open and some of them have a survival mechanic that you have to worry about. You can freeze to death if you don't get to the next bonfire in time. This is supposed to make the exploration more fun I guess, but it only makes it more annoying if you ask me. It's a shame because Vikings Wolves of Midgar could have been a very solid Diablo-like action RPG. Which is coincidentally the same thing I said about another isometric Viking RPG that I covered in the previous video. I really wouldn't recommend buying this game today unless you can get it for free with PSN subscription. Number 3. Insomnia the Ark The wind shall blow once more. The sleep that has lasted for so many years is about to end. Insomnia the Ark is a diesel punk sci-fi RPG which came out in 2018 after it got successfully funded on Kickstarter. This game is set on an abandoned space metropolis where the humanity is trying to survive. Your character wakes up from a cryogenic sleep and he's infected with a rare psychological disease. And unknowingly, he's holding humanity's last hope in his bare hands. This game is really slow in the beginning, up to the point where I almost quit out of boredom. One of the reasons for that is the quest design and how hard it is to get around this map. You can find yourself going in circles a lot, at least I did. First of all, I was always a big advocate for no quest markers in RPGs. But in order for this to work, you really have to know what you're doing with the map and quest design. The in-game map itself is not very helpful, and the way it's designed makes it really frustrating to constantly search for the right NPC. You get this menu that you use for traveling between different locations, and it works the same like in any other CRPG. There are random events which can happen, which are not very fun to be honest. That being said, the biggest strength of this game is definitely the atmosphere which the environment is creating. They really managed to nail this aspect of the game. On the other side, Insomnia can feel like a very generic Unreal Engine 4 game, especially when it comes to character models and crappy optimization. The story and the setting are interesting and the writing is okay, but it's hard to take it seriously. Maybe this is just me, but I feel like I played a ton of games where the character models look exactly like this. What is that? What is that? Wait! They look devoid of life and the lack of voice acting is not helping at all. It's not just about the lack of voice acting, the game lacks sound effects in general. NPCs feel like puppets and they don't even have any random voice lines or sound effects outside of combat. I mean sure, quiet nature of the game kinda helps with the dark and gloomy atmosphere which the game is trying really hard to portray. It works in a way if you can ignore the issues I mentioned. This game has a lot of talking and I actually think they did a good job with the dialogue. The majority of sentences are well compiled in just a couple of rows which are easy to read. 
but the sheer abundance of dialogue and NPCs makes the game boring if you ask me. I mean the story is good, but not good enough to justify so much dialogue in the game. There is a lot more talking than fighting in this game, by the way. The combat was a lot more fun than expected, to be honest. Sure, it's really janky, but not in a bad way, if that makes sense. You can pretty much die in just a couple of shots or melee hits, but the same goes for the enemy as well. That kinda brings it to question the balancing and how important are the stats, because the combat feels almost exactly the same throughout the whole game. The combat takes a while to get used to, especially when it comes to aiming a ranged weapon. It's not a traditional third person shooter, to say the least. Your camera doesn't move when you control the crosshair, which is a bit off-putting at first. What I didn't get used to is the camera itself, because it doesn't allow you to move it vertically. You're pretty much stuck with this angle, which can be really frustrating at times. The range combat relies a lot on the cover, even though the game doesn't exactly have a cover mechanic. You have a crouch button, which you use to hide behind objects. The melee combat is functional, but nothing to write home about. The block is kinda OP in this game, even against guns. Insomnia has a lot of mini-games, and some of them are okay I guess, but I found them boring in general. It also has skill checks, which can help you find some extra loot and do a specific quest in a different way. Speaking about loot, the game does a decent job with the gear you can find, buy or craft. There is an inventory management system and you can increase the weight you can carry with the different backpacks. This game has survival elements as well, but I didn't find them annoying as I usually do. Overall, I think most people will find this game very boring, especially because of the bad pacing and level design. I wouldn't recommend playing it today, but you be the judge. Cheating. Number 2. The Cursed Crusades The Curse Crusade is an action-adventure that came out in 2011 for PC and last-gen consoles. A lot of people recommended this game in my previous videos, so I decided to check it out. This game is actually delisted on Steam and all other online stores all the way back in 2017. So the only way to get it nowadays is to try and get the physical version or buy... Um, other methods. The reason for delisting the game is uncertain, and it could be due to several corporate changes, including restructuring between Altus and Atlus USA, or developer Kyloton's acquisition by Big Ben Interactive. That's the only info I could find about this topic on the internet. But who cares about that, let's talk about the game itself. Good luck! Ah. Remember when game studios thought that quick time events were really cool? Well, if you don't, this game will happily remind you about that. I mean seriously, the whole gameplay is almost entirely based around quick time events. Even the combat feels like one big QTE with mindless button mashing. However, the biggest redeeming factor is definitely the co-op feature, because you can force one of your friends to suffer with you. I'm a terrible boyfriend, so I forced my girlfriend to play this game with me. Oh look, I can actually hit you. And the most fun we got out of this game was trying to get a better grade at the end and compare the number of kills. The Curse Crusade is very heavy on the presentation and the story, there are a bunch of cutscenes in every mission. The story follows a mercenary slash Templar called Denz and his friend Esteban Noviembre. Esteban has probably one of the worst fake Spanish accents that I ever heard in a game. You're serious about this Crusada thing, eh? You know Denz, where I come from. They'd call this a mission suicida. Both of these characters suffer from a demonic curse. Madre de Dios. They are plagued by death itself, and you have to fight him from time to time, but you can never actually kill him. I wonder why. I am death. Your main goal is to find the cure for the curse and save your souls from eternal damnation. The dialogue in this game feels like it was written by a 12 year old, to be honest. I'm a lord. They rain arrows on us like a pissing cow! The most important thing related to this curse is how it affects the gameplay itself. You can activate the demon mode, which increases the speed of your attacks and the damage, I assume. 
it's really hard to tell because you don't actually get to see health bars on enemies. The only game I played that managed to do this right was Monster Hunter. This game has a similar philosophy, I guess, because certain armor parts will fall off the enemy when you hit them, but it's not really helpful. The Cursed Crusade has 5 chapters and each chapter has different missions, which push the story forward. As you would assume, you can control both of these characters in the split-screen co-op mode, even on the PC. Split-screen on the PC feels like a distant past in gaming, even though we could see some indie games nowadays with this feature. Anyway, as I was saying, most of the gameplay features rely on QTEs. Moving stuff out of the way, opening gates and doors, even jumping on the platform takes forever. If you're playing in the co-op mode, you get to do this with a friend, which can make it a bit more interesting, but even the worst game ever can be fun in co-op. I would be ready to forgive this bullshit design and ignore the fact that you could physically get through these gates without opening them if the combat was any good. But nope, it's a mindless button masher with a lot of RNG. Finishing moves can happen in the first couple of hits or after 20 hits with a weapon. The parry mechanic is one of the worst I ever experienced, it doesn't require any timing at all, and of course, quick time events will frequently pop up in the middle of the combat. Not to mention the sound effects, which sound like you're hitting a trash can. The entire quote-unquote character progression system doesn't matter at all, because the combat feels exactly the same throughout the entire game, it's almost totally pointless. It's a shame, because the presentation of the game is actually very pleasant for the eyes. The game frequently uses the shaky camera effect, which seems like someone is following these characters with a camera, and I kinda like it. Speaking about the camera, it has a mind of its own. You're technically able to control it, but there are a bunch of scenes where the camera angles change completely, which only makes controlling the character way worse. There are a lot of interactive cutscenes, basically, which only require you to press one or two buttons while you're watching the game play itself. To sum it up, The Cursed Crusade has a lot of issues and questionable design decisions, but the split-screen co-op makes the experience a lot more fun. The game is a product of its own time, but 2011 had much better action adventures and action RPGs, so this is not exactly a valid excuse. Should you go out your way and try to get the physical copy nowadays? Only if you're really, really bored. We should have seen this coming. Sneaking in is going to be impossible. Why can't it be easy? You know, we knock, somebody opens, we fight. Number 1. Drakensag the Dark Eye. So Drakensack the Dark Eye is an RPG from 2008, developed by a German studio called Redon Labs. It's definitely a game that went under the radar, and after playing it for the first time ever, I would even say that it's a real hidden gem. Good day, what'll it be? It reminds me a lot of Dragon Age Origins, and if you're a fan of that game, I would seriously recommend trying out Drakensack. For some reason, I was convinced that Dragon Age Origins came out before this game, but that's not true. Drakensang came out a whole year before Dragon Age Origins. I discovered this game a long time before, shortly after I played Dragon Age Origins, but for whatever the reason, I never played it. So it was a perfect time to go back and finally try it out, and I'm really glad I did. This game obviously didn't have nowhere near the budget of Dragon Age Origins, and you can easily tell that when it comes to some features. However, this game still has a lot to offer. It's an interesting question, one that I've had plenty of time to think about. First of all, it's very slow paced, like very slow paced. This will probably be a major turn off for some people, but if you love CRPGs, you probably won't have a lot of issues with that. Although most modern CRPGs with real time combat usually have an option to speed up the gameplay. Anyway, Dragon Saga is based on the pen and paper role playing rules of the Dark Eye. That's the most popular pen and paper role-playing game from Germany, which had very limited international success. Long story short, you shouldn't have a lot of issues with how the game works if you played games like Neverwinter Nights, Baldur's Gate or Dragon Age Origins. The story of Drakensang starts off really simple. You get a letter from a friend called Ardo, who lives in the city of Erdok. I am turning to you in what are now dark times. Ardo is asking you for your assistance, but in order to get to Ferdak, you first need some letters of recommendation. You start the game in a place called Avestru, and this is basically your tutorial area. 
you'll find a couple of simple quests here and you should learn how some mechanics work. It might be a bit overwhelming if you never played a similar game before, but you'll be fine. Shortly after, you will arrive in the city of Ferduck where the main quest opens up. It turns out your buddy Ardo was killed and your quest is to find out who did it. It's a very lengthy investigation and the game continues to build up the story after it. Drakensang doesn't give you a lot of options when it comes to the story, you won't get to make important decisions. However, the dialogue itself is pretty decent and I really like how it's presented. You get this zoomed in perspective with the character you're speaking on the sides. Even though this is showcasing the age of the game with some low resolution textures on the characters. But I was pleasantly surprised with the number of different looking character models. If you watch my reviews about games from this time period, I usually ramble about the character models and how many clones there are in the game. It's not like Drakensack doesn't have any clones, but important characters in the game usually have unique looking models. It's definitely worth some praise, especially because this game didn't have a big budget. When it comes to the gameplay, it's almost exactly what you would expect from a CRPG. You get to make and customize your own character with an impressive amount of different classes to choose. This is a party based RPG, you'll be able to have up to 6 characters in your party. Unfortunately, these characters are not all that interesting from the story perspective. They do have some banter here and there and some different comments about certain situations, but that's pretty much it. Are the merchants allowed to block any road they feel like? As for the gameplay, you have a tactical pause and you get to issue commands to all of your followers. Like I said, the gameplay is very slow, so you always have more than enough time to figure out what you're going to do in combat. It starts off kind of challenging, but as you progress through the game and when you figure out how things work, it becomes pretty easy. I think the biggest issue with the combat is the lack of meaningful boss fights and enemy variety in general. It gets very easy after a certain point, but I still found it enjoyable. I think it's a very chill RPG to play, it was a relaxing experience. When it comes to the game world, this should also be familiar if you played similar games. The world map starts unlocking new areas after you finish a certain quest and there are about 6 or 7 different locations that you'll get to explore. The main city of Ferduck is the only location that you're going to visit frequently, while other locations will be permanently locked when you're done with them. At first, I thought I'm not going to like the game world that much since the first location has a yellow and brownish color palette that I'm not a huge fan of. It basically looks like a bad Instagram filter. But as you unlock new areas, you'll find out that the game has a decent visual variety. I mean, sure, many assets have very low res textures, but the atmosphere which the game creates is still pretty good. Overall, it's a pleasant game for the eyes. Drakensack the Dark Eye is a very chill game to play and I recommend checking it out if you can handle those issues I mentioned. Sure, it has some underwhelming features, but I still think it's worth playing. You can easily get 30 plus hours from it. Rondra. Take the Drink blood, my sword! Yes. I'll have GOG links for some of these games, so if you decide to buy them, you'll support my channel by using those links. Tell me which game looks very interesting to you, if any, and did you even know about some of these games? Leave a comment down below. They rain arrows on us like a pissing cow! Feel free to recommend some obscure and forgotten RPGs and I might feature them in one of the future videos. Anyway, subscribing to the channel and liking the video would be highly appreciated. If you want to go a step further, you can become a Patreon or a YouTube member. Even the smallest contribution a month means a lot. That would be all and I'll see you in the next one.